everyone. Welcome to Beyond Markets, where we look at the stories beyond the markets in your region. We are going to be talking to Dr. Bakary Diallo. He's rector of the African Virtual University, and he joins us in the Nairobi studio for more on ICT education and trading opportunities. In the studio, we're going to have Will Jimson, CEO of Musa Capital, to look at private equity in Africa. And then we'll also be looking at annual CEO portfolio conference. We'll be going over to Abuja to speak with Mohamed Joji, the Secretary General of the Airline Operators of Nigeria, about the safety of air travel. First, let's take a look at stories making headlines across the continent. Top cocoa producer Cote d'Ivoire is set to record economic growth of 9% next year and 10% in 2014. That's according to the country's prime minister. The IMF is predicting growth at around 8% this year for the West African economy, which is emerging from a decade of political deadlock. Angola's economic prospects this year remain favorable despite a recent easing in global oil prices, according to the IMF. The fund has called on the government to improve the transparency of how it manages its oil profits. Growth is projected at around 7% in 2012. The IMF says growth should ease to 5% next year. A four-day African Virtual University workshop underway in Nairobi aims to create and strengthen the capacity of the university and the 53 institutions across Africa coordinated by the university in their delivery and management of quality ICT integrated education and training opportunities. For more, we have Dr. Bakari Diallo. He's a rector of the African Virtual University and is joining us from our studios in Nairobi. A very warm welcome to you, Doctor. I would like us to jump right into it. First of all, to start talking about the success that the university has had in the past couple of years that it has been operating. What has been your success been like when it comes to what you're offering? Dr. Yala, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. We were talking about... Good evening from Nairobi. We were talking about the success of the AVU in the years that it has been operating. What kind of response have you received? What has been the success, the, the, the success of the university been like? Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, the, uh, as you, you know, we just had a, uh, a workshop with 21 countries um, and the 27 universities here in Nairobi. We concluded the workshop um, in um, uh, last uh, Thursday. Uh, we are very happy about um, the intake of ICT in education in, in Africa. Um, uh, basically, in our network, um, meaning uh, universities from Francophone Afri Africa, from Anglophone Africa, and from um, uh, Portuguese-speaking countries. Uh, as you know, um, the continent is facing a major challenge in terms of enrolling all um, students that uh, need to go to universities. And it's quite clear that in many countries and in, in uh, most of the universities, the capacity is not there anymore um, to limit um, universities uh, within the walls. So we are proposing an alternative to um, accessing uh, education, and it's uh, going quite well. So, so one of the issues that you've been looking at is that quality education and, and, and putting things in place to be able to, 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 to provide that quality education. What are the things that you've put into place, the structures or, or the organs that you've put in place so that you can ensure that you are offering a quality service? You know, um, thank you for the question. Um, quality is uh, first uh, what we put first. It, it's very important. So what we put in place is that uh, we make sure that we have a, a quality assurance framework. Um, this is a, um, a term that is mostly used in education, but I will explain what is it. It looks at all the aspect of the delivery, um, all the aspect of um, development of the content, all the aspect of recruiting um, um, staff, uh, including faculty members, but also students. So we have different uh, um, uh, criteria and items we are looking at to ensure that uh, we everything we do within uh, the virtual university and within our network of universities um, in Africa, uh, that uh, the, the final product uh, has high quality um, standards, not only for Africa, but for, for the rest of the world. I can give you a concrete example of that. We 
post it online uh, some of our courses, about uh, 219 courses for free. This is um, a new trend called Open Educational Resources. Um, and once we did that, um, uh, we now have um, uh, um, learners from around 193 countries around the world. This is beyond Africa. So just to tell you, um, to give you an example of the quality and uh, uh, of, of the products and uh, the, the courses we have. Doctor, I would like to talk about, you talked about capacity. I would like to talk about what you're doing at the university in terms of, you know, have you, do you have partners that are working with the universities in terms of developing the content or even, you know, the reach that you have? Because as you're talking about 193 countries, that is quite a lot of people that you would be servicing. Yes, uh, no, the example I provided is that uh, we put our course, some of our courses for free for anyone to access online and in the world. And we uh, have now um, uh, people from 193 worldwide um, accessing the content, including Brazil, including the United States, France, um, and other countries. But uh, we are mostly focused on working uh, in working with African countries. Currently, we work um, with 27 African countries um, and with about uh, um, uh, 53 universities, but 35 of them are mostly active. And uh, what we do with um, the, the universities and the countries, uh, I would like to also tell you that AVU is a uh, intergovernmental organization, meaning that uh, several countries have signed a charter establishing AVU as the intergovernmental. And our mission is to assist countries and universities to increase access to quality high education through the innovative use of information and communication technologies. So we have several activities with the uh, countries and the universities, uh, including um, uh, content development and delivery. This is one of our core activities whereas we work with um, uh, universities across um, language groups and, and barriers or, and, uh, and countries to develop common content that are delivered through the country. So this is uh, one of the things we do. Uh, I hope that I answered your question. I would like to talk a little bit about f funding and, and how the, the, the university, you've talked about, about the partners that you have. Let's talk a little bit about your funding model because I would imagine that even though it is ICT, that there, there must be quite a lot of money that you would need to be able to develop the content, get that content to the students as well. Yes, um, uh, we, we are uh, currently uh, uh, supported uh, financially and technically by the African Development Bank. Um, you know, um, to put in place ICT in education uh, programs, there is an upfront investment one need to do. Um, and we are assisting um, uh, through the African Virtual University and the funding we are receiving from uh, our partners and donors, uh, including well, and, uh, the African Development Bank. We um, develop contents, uh, we fund the development of the content, but also we fund infrastructure. As you know, in most of our countries, access to internet is uh, not uh, something that is easy, or and even sometime access uh, to uh, infrastructure with uh, reliable, reliable power is, is an issue. So we address uh, that uh, issue by uh, installing what we call open design and learning centers in our selected partner institutions. So these institutions, mostly universities, are then connected 24 hours a day and uh, are able to uptake e-learning. Um, another area that uh, we uh, assist uh, countries and universities in research and development, um, in distance and e-learning, in open education, um, and uh, we are going to set up, for instance, a um, uh, mobile learning lab here in Nairobi because we believe that uh, mobile learning has a huge potential in Africa and we're trying to see how we can unlock uh, that potential. The other area we are focusing uh, with the money uh, we are receiving is uh, to make sure that we have enough of our sisters and, and, um, and um, nieces, I mean, to have more females uh, taking, uptaking um, 
uh, uh, Dr. Diallo, especially in Dr. Diallo, we yes. are going to, I'm, I'm sorry, we've run out of time for this interview. We're going to have to wrap. Thank you so much for joining us. That was Dr. Bakari Diallo. He's a rector of the African Virtual University and back to South Africa where Musa fund managers today held their annual CEO portfolio conference, which is seen as one of many tools to stimulate management development and increase the awareness of our portfolio companies. We get more details on this with Will Jimison, CEO of Musa Capital. A very warm welcome to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Well, let's just start with, with, with some of the conversation that you've been hearing because private equity does seem to be, you know, you do hear some people who are very positive about the African mm -hmm. continent and then you get the flip side of that. So, so what has been the response and some of the conversation you're hearing? It was a very exciting conference today and, and partly one of the topics was how much is the talk around private equity becoming a reality in terms of capital being deployed. Um, the answer is it's not as much as it should be. Mm -hmm. You know, as, as Africans, we starve for the reality of there's uh, a lot more demand for basic goods and services on the continent than there is supply of it. And that's from be it capital, be it housing, be it access to, to running water, be it IT services, as the, as the doctor mentioned earlier, be it education, there's still the opportunity in Africa outstrips the, the amount of capital that's being deployed. And why is that? Perceptions. Um, the, uh, we had the benefit this, this afternoon of having one of the speakers was Jay Coe, who's the uh, chief strategist and head of private equity funds at OPIC, which is Overseas Private Investment Corporation. Um, they're, they're, a com they're committed to Africa, but their program is designed to lead the way by putting U.S. government funding in place for managers like ourselves to attract third-party funding. One of his challenges is that to date, most 80% of the funding in private equity for Africa is development financial institutions like themselves, IFC, um, World Bank, et cetera, going to other parts of the world, other BRIC nations, Brazil, China, India, the dominance of private equity activity, it's by the private market. It, and what his challenge was is that ultimately, Africa has to invest in Africa. And that has to take place here at home through it, local institutions, local pension funds, local insurance companies, uh, local institutions like the PIC, et cetera, that have capital. And, and one of the things that, one of the themes in today's conference from a number of the portfolio companies that we're currently invested in is that the impact that we have had on them as a fund manager bringing governance and, and access to, to third party funding and so forth, that's been great. But our greatest impact is the fact that we could write a check. Our ability to do that is fundamentally linked to attracting third party investors into the continent. But that's linked to investors here at home putting their money where their mouth is. And so, and so how much of that do you see happening though? Because I mean, if there is all this capital and then you're saying that I would imagine that not enough of it is being invested. That's true, but it, it's turning the tide. I mean, earlier this year, we see institutions like PIC taking the lead. Uh, the CEO earlier this year has on a number of occasions announced their intention as an institution to be in Africa, not just South Africa in the in a private sense, in private equity, not just the listed, which they have a very uh, a very prevalent uh, uh, position already, is to go up continent. Uh, they did so, they made a $250 million commitment to EcoBank earlier this year, primarily because EcoBank is an extremely well-run company. It happened to be one of our first investments in our first fund back in 1995, but it also is a platform for them to see other activity within the continent. So it is happening. What I'd like to ask you, if you've, you've talked about Ecobank and you've talked about a well-run business, what I'd like to ask you is, is what are you looking for? A private equity investor is looking for what in a business? I mean, I would imagine it being well-run is obviously fun, is absolutely crucial. It's crucial and it's um, uh, a very broad question, but I'll give a broad answer to it, which is consistent no matter what area of the diaspora of private equity you're involved in, whether it's venture capital and startups to mid-sized companies, which is what we invest in primarily, or large cap companies, which my private equity counterparts at Braid or an Ethos would invest in. No matter what the, what the sector may be, what the geography is, it's people. Ultimately, businesses are run by people. And particularly in an African context, one of the comments, one of the, uh, one of the speakers at lunch, uh, Inkasana Moya, who's former African Development Bank, he's also a former executive director of Actis, which is a large private equity investor throughout, throughout the world, emerging markets in Africa. He, he made the good point that the numbers and analysis and return on equity and, and profitability, all those things are important, but ultimately it's the people you're investing in. And by the nature of our business being private equity, it's not because 
the nature of the transaction is private and is hidden from the public is because it's a private relationship between an investor and an investee. You mentioned something about the diaspora, and I would like mm -hmm. to delve into that a little bit. There are a lot of very, very successful business people that are not that are African and not living on the African continent mm -hmm. anymore. How much of a role can they play in, in bringing Huge. money back onto the Huge. continent? Huge. One of the again, one of the comments today was that why is there such an opportunity in Africa because of its resources? Now, often we think about that. We think about the platinum and the diamonds and the gold and so forth in the ground, but that's not it. That's not it in, in its entirety. Africa's most significant resource are its people. And as Dr. Moria pointed out, we haven't figured that out yet. We haven't figured out how to capitalize on a billion people. We have an unemployment rate here in South Africa that, I guess, you know, depending on statistics you believe, is somewhere between 30 and 65 percent. And you take Africans from a previously disadvantaged background, that number can be even significantly higher. I was speaking to a really successful South African entrepreneur yesterday, and he said to me that he had himself funded research to look at entrepreneurship on the African continent compared to entrepreneurship and innovation in the U.S. And in the U.S., he'd taken the state of California, mm -hmm. compared it to innovation uh, in terms of potential for innovation in Southern Africa. And what he found was that in California, the, the survey that he had done mm -hmm. was that 34 out of 100 people had the potential and, and the drive and the, um, you know, the opportunity for them to be, in it, to be innovative, to be successful entrepreneurs. In Southern Africa, it was 74%. Mm -hmm. And then he said, though, if you looked at the funding, the funding in, in, in California, 68% of those 34 people could get funding. Mm -hmm. And when it came to Southern Africa, it was less than zero. I think it was 0.07%. How do we change that around if there is such a drive for innovation, if there is such a drive for inter entrepreneurship? How do we change that around and actually make these businesses viable? Yeah. No, you, well, you hit it on the head. It's the fu funding is one of the keys, not the only key, because the, it's enough to be, have the drive and the opportunity to innovate. You have to have the environment as well. And funding, providing the funding is one of those, part of creating that environment. And you know, I often say is I'm an adopted South African, kind of a brother from another mother, but having been here 17 years, I believe in Africa. Even more so, I believe in South Africa and the things that government has already started to do, even private sector as well. The Richard Branson Institute is a great example. Uh, the Young Entrepreneurs Program is a great example, uh, sponsored, sponsored by DTI. Not perfect yet, we're getting there, but it's to say that, look guys, you go through uh, in, in the Young Entrepreneurs Program, Go through a year of training and development. Let, let us teach you, let's, let's harness that passion and then let's systematically teach you how to put it to work. And at the end of the process, when you learn how to do that, we'll provide the funding for you. Mm -hmm. Those are the models that are necessary. It's not rocket science. The, the U.S. is able to provide 68% of those, of those entrepreneurs with opportunity because they've been doing it for the last 50 years. The institutions in the states and Europe are built to support entrepreneurs. Unfortunately, as Africans, we haven't learned to, to, to transform our institutions to serve that. I mean, think about the context here in South Africa. The very PIC and the IDCs that are, are targeting to serve the broader population now, 25 years ago, they ignored that population. You know, it was built for, what, 10% of the population maybe? So there's some patience that needs to take place as well uh, as we try to figure out what's necessary to transform. Thank you so much for coming in. No, it was fantastic you. It's always a pleasure. Well, that was Will Jimison. He is CEO of Mr. Capital. We're taking a short break and return details of the preliminary report of the Dana aircraft crash in Nigeria. Do you stay tuned for that. Welcome back. We crossed to Abuja for a closer look at preliminary reports on the Dana Air crash as compiled by the National Transportation Safety Board. We have Mr. Muhammad Georgi, Secretary General of the Airline Operators of Nigeria, and he's live from Abuja. Very warm welcome to you, Mr. Georgi. I would like to start with this, um, with just the report that we received, and I'm sure you've taken a look at this report as well. From what you were able to see from the report, from the investigations that have taken place, is this a crash that could have been prevented? Yeah, um, the, so are you talking about the preliminary accident investigation that has just been released? 
We're talking about the Dana air crash. Yeah, yeah you see, the Dana aircraft, um, what happened here in Nigeria, whenever an accident happened like that, there was a lot of um, speculation that even some experts who have never flown an aircraft as passengers, they have the audacity to comment, believing that they know what happened on the accident. Um, notwithstanding that, that aircraft is a very good aircraft. Dana has five aircraft from 1990 to 1991. All of them, from the factory to the first owner, nothing wrong with them, beautiful aircraft. So as far as we are concerned, the aircraft are well maintained, the history is there, the pilots are well qualified, the captain has 18,000 hours total time, he has 7,000 hours on the type of aeroplane on command. So as far as we're concerned, his medical, his simulator, his license, they are all current. And the aircraft has just undergone a sea check, the aircraft are undergone a current air check. So as far as we are concerned, the aircraft is very good. Let me also tell you, the entire accident statistic in Nigeria from 1969 to date, we have about, about 27 accidents, major ones, with a loss of life of about 980 people. None of the accident is related to any mechanical failure. It's all due to human factor. But let's talk about... Which is uh, uh, relevant. Uh, but, but one of the things that was said about this particular crash was that two engines went out at the sa same time. And even reading the report, this is, this is, this is what was, that came from the operators themselves. Why was that engine failure where you have two engines going out and then saying that there wasn't a mechanical problem? The history of engine failure is not only here. If you look at the British Airways 777-200, 17 January 2008, Registration Golf, Yankee Mike, 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 flying from Beijing to Heathrow, just landed short that all the two engines switched off, all of them. The brand new aircraft, the engine eyes up, lost both engine, was lucky to be, un to be inside the perimeter of Heathrow Airport. Had that accident happened a minute before, that aircraft should have crashed right in the center of London and you could have seen the catastrophe. So the Dan but, aircraft accident, but, but you Mr. lost both engine, but Mr. nothing Georgie, unusual. But Mr. Georgie, I mean, your, your example there, I mean, it didn't happen. You know, you're giving the Heathrow example there, but that didn't happen. There wasn't the kind of loss of lives that was there with the Dana crash. And from what I'm reading from the report, and this is a report that, I, that I'm sure you also have been able to go through, was that it seems as though yeah, there were yeah. mechanical problems. And, and even just reading from the operators and, and, and the reports that they were giving before the crash happened, they seem to have to even have seen this problem before, obviously before the crash happened? No, you see, as, as I was trying to tell you, it's a lot of this speculation, innuendos and shenanigans. There has not been nothing, nothing at all, to relate that um, accident to mechanical failure. Now, the preliminary report is out, the flight data recorder burned out, but the cockpit voice recorder from there, all they mention is double engine failure. Nobody can tell you whether it's a mechanical problem or not. It is not unusual to lose two engines in an aircraft, not unusual at all. So whoever tells you, the report did not tell you there's a mechanical failure on, the, on those engines. What we have to wait is to wait for the result of the tear down on those engines by, by Pratt & Whitney to see what actually happens. Thank you so much for joining us, Ms. Georgi. We have run out of time. That was Mohamed Georgi, Secretary General of the Airline Operators of Nigeria. And that's a wrap from the Beyond Markets team. Thank you so much for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your viewing right here on CNBC Africa. Ciao.